Good afternoon. The term storage is, is very uh, loosely used because it means a lot of things, a lot of different things to a lot of different people, including customers and uh, companies in the energy business, as well as grid operators. So at the end of the presentation, I'll be talking uh, substantially about uh, compressed air, but I wanna put it into context in terms of how storage actually operates so that you have get a, a, a good context as we go forward. Just a little thing about uh, the Canadian Energy Research Institute. We've been around since 1975. We do work related to economic and environmental analysis on energy issues. We look at oil, gas, and electricity in both the supply and the demand side, and we cover much of the country in terms of these various issues. Sometimes we're focused on oil and gas in Western Canada. Sometimes we're fo focused on electricity in Central Canada, et cetera, et cetera. We're a not-for-profit organization. As such, we, we're uh, uh, relying on funding from different organizations. Our three core funders uh, include the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, the Government of Canada, and the Government of Alberta. We're also funded by other industry organizations and other governments, as well as the Ivy Foundation. And in addition to that, we have a number of outreach activities with a number of organizations across the country. So I'm going to take you through our uh, project that we've done. Uh, it's not even finished yet. Actually, it won't be out for another couple of weeks. So this is the very first time our information is being presented to the public. Uh, keep in mind that all of our research is public, and it's free, and it's on our website. And we've got some various uh, pieces of information related to the oil and gas market that might be of interest to some of you if you want to just go on our website. So we're going to talk about three of the main uh, services that, that uh, storage provides, and that includes behind-the-fence um, applications, so this is for large customers in, in most cases, uh, energy arbitrage, uh, and sort of Catherine was talking about it a little bit as well. Uh, we'll skip through most of that because it's, it's not much of an issue in this country. And then, of course, renewable energy farming, where you get uh, longer-term requirements for uh, storage and what are the, the various options available and where does um, uh, compressed air fit into that. So energy storage, as I mentioned, you hear a lot about it, and uh, it's all over the news. But in particular, it's really there to help offset some of the large capital costs of electricity grid infrastructure. So for example, when you're dealing with uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, how are you gonna try and firm that up? Because you know, sometimes building additional generation is, is more expensive than if you're using storage. Uh, and in particular, it's, it's as a result of the uh, high costs associated with dealing with, with peak electricity demand. Energy storage is also being considered as part of the overall smart energy evolution. So uh, smart, sorry, smart grid evolution, which gets into how you can uh, maximize the use of your grids and reduce the amount of additional capital you need to put into that. And that in part comes with uh, trying to uh, match your, your um, grid requirements at the distribution level. So maybe there's a neighborhood or, or a city that has a different load profile than the rest of the, of the system. And you can use more directed storage to help manage that system. Uh, if you've got, for example, if you're in a community and there's a, a large industrial load, you're going to have a different uh, load profile than if it was mostly uh, uh, residences in that community. Now you'll see from this chart that the work we did doesn't cover the full scope of the storage requirements. Catherine talked a little bit about frequency regulation. There's, there's some of that that's required. That's very short term and very fine tuned uh, types of storage. And so we really are talking about more immediate things and get into types of technologies like uh, ultra super capacitors that have uh, millisecond uh, reaction times. 
and, uh, and some battery technologies as well. Transmission and distribution services, we didn't really get into that because we were really focused on what most provinces are looking at now, which is the integration of renewable technologies. And that really drives a lot of their concern about energy storage. And sometimes when they build these, these storage projects, they'll build some of the transmission and distribution services into that. But there's other times when you have congestion issues where you could build storage right in those congestion areas to alleviate the congestion on the system. Uh, it's, these are very unique situations and can be quite expensive if you have uh, alternative requirements, but storage can sometimes be a reasonable uh, solution for those areas. So we focused on, on uh, behind the meter and bulk energy services. So we'll, let me just take you through that. So the number of types of storage technologies out there is vast. And you can see here, we list things such as uh, supercapacitors, flywheels, lithium batteries, lead acid batteries, flow batteries, which are more related to liquids moving back and forth, hydrogen and fuel cells, pumped hydro and compressed air energy storage. So there's a vast amount of options available and each option has its own unique characteristics for which it fits into part of the overall requirement for services on the system. One size does not fit all, one technology does not fit all. So when you talk about things like batteries, if they're looking at large scale, long term requirements for the grid, batteries might not necessarily be the best approach to take. So our study, we looked at three cases. We're looking at bill management on the customer side, and that's really related to managing their peak demand charges, bulk energy arbitrage, you know, buy low, sell high, and renewable energy firming, which is principally the issue we were dealing with in much of our analysis. The two metrics that we were using was internal rate of return because for cases one and two, those are really business decisions to make some money. In case three, we were really looking at the levelized cost. And the levelized cost is what is the least cost available technologies that can be used to provide that same service. So in the case of renewable energy firming, there's a number of different technologies that can be used. Of course, the cheaper ones should be the ones that are most often chosen because we're trying to minimize the overall cost to the system. So uh, the cost, the technologies generally now are high. The opportunities right now are small, but that's not going to stay the case uh, going forward into the future. There's a lot of declining costs that have been observed now and into the future. This is similar in, in a lot of respects for a lot of pieces of the electricity system. So when we're talking about uh, um, generation technologies. The price of natural gas, the price of wind, the price of solar has all come down. Even the price of coal, carbon capture and storage has come down. Even the price of nuclear has come down. The price of new transmission lines is coming down. The use of direct current transmission lines versus alternate current trans uh, tra uh, transmission lines means that uh, smaller line losses and longer distances Things that we couldn't do before, we're gonna be able to do now. Going farther and farther into the north to bring down uh, whatever type of energy source you're looking for. We have, we're broadening our horizons because we can go farther. So when we look at the fact that these costs of getting generation to customers is going down, that means the business case for storage becomes that much harder. What we did in terms of our studies, we did a, a number of analysis looking at the long-term costs of the different storage options. And we've got six here. We have pumped hydro, the compressed air, hydrogen-based fuel cells, flow batteries, lithium-ion batteries, and lead batteries. And you can see from this chart that, in particular, the pumped hydro and the compressed air are based on mature technologies. There's not a lot of room. There is some room. I mean, the stuff that Catherine's doing is, of course, a very good example. There is some room, but there's not a lot of room to move to a uh, much cheaper option than what we have right now. 
We're using well understood technologies. We're using well understood physics. There's not much room there. In terms of the other ones, though, there's a significant room for technological improvement and therefore cost reductions. And this plays into our overall analysis that we're talking about. So the first application that we're dealing with here is uh, bill management using behind the meter storage. And we were looking at commercial and industrial customers and identifying those customers in our analysis where the demand charges were significant. And unfortunately for Ontario, <laughs> This is a great place where demand charges are significant. Um, so you can decrease those charges by shaving the peak demand, either through storage or just cutting out the activity for a period of time. So for those that have the ability to just shift the work to a different time, that's actually the cheapest option. But if they don't have the ability to shift to a different time, they'll use energy storage to cut off their peak during that time period. And it is all driven on the structure of the, of the uh, rates and, and the bills that they get. Now, when we did this analysis, you can see here, again, I'm, I recall that we used an internal rate of return. Much of these do not actually make any money until the mid-2020s. So these are secondary schools, hotels, hospitals, large offices, and strip malls. You get out to that time period in the 2025, 20, 2030, it starts to make sense. But right now, because of the price and because of, of how the systems are built, you don't see that much of an opportunity for behind the meter. And in these cases, these are all battery options. We're not talking about compressed air. We're not talking about pumped hydro. We're talking about battery options and actually moving towards flow batteries as being the preeminent option in this case. When it comes to the second application that we looked at, which is uh, arbitrage, which is, of course, very simple, you know, buy low, sell high. First of all, you have to have a market where you've got uh, the ability to uh, operate there, where you've got multiple players. Now, for the most part, the only jurisdiction in Canada that has that is uh, Alberta. There are some restrictions and, and in Ontario, you can, you can play in that market. But there are a lot of challenges associated with the Ontario market compared to the, the Alberta market. So the Alberta market is really the purest market in terms of uh, market clearing prices. What we found was, if you look at the, the types of options we were looking at, which is the compressed air and flow batteries and lithium ion batteries, none of them passed the test. The reason is, um, the price differential between peak and base power is too small. So when you think about whatever the, the, the base rate is, uh, the peak needs to be substantially higher. And in this case, we're, we didn't identify what the numbers would be, but in the range of maybe 100% or 150% higher. Right now, in most jurisdictions in Canada, the difference between the base and peak prices, if you look at some of the markets, is maybe 25, 50%. So not enough to make a difference. So arbitrage is for financial reasons, doesn't necessarily make sense. I mean, if it's needed for the grid in terms of managing the load, that's something different. That's when you would have a capacity contract. Uh, but if you're just looking at it to try and make money, you're not gonna be making any money. So move on to something that's gonna make you some money. This last one, uh, the third application, which is the one which uh, focuses a lot on, uh, on uh, compressed air, is really the how to turn an intermittent source into a firm source. So the intermittent sources in, in uh, Canada, uh, in particular wind and solar, are, can be in the 25 to 40% range of availability. You really need to have something as a firm source uh, that's available at significantly higher uh, values. You notice here 90% during peak periods and 60% otherwise. We, what we were trying to do with our analysis, uh, as noted here, is to mimic the availability of a natural gas combined cycle turbine. So how do you do that with energy storage? When we did the analysis, we looked across the country. 
Um, and of course, the wind availability is different in one province to the next. Uh, Alberta's got some of the best wind. BC's got some of the worst, which was surprising to me. Ontario's about in the middle. Right? Uh, solar PV, uh, again, Alberta's got some of the best and BC's got some of the worst and Ontario's somewhere in the middle. Uh, I think there's a little bit of pattern going across the country. We looked at different options. We looked at battery storage, both lithium and flow batteries. We looked at the hydrogen fuel cells, pumped hydro, and compressed air. And we were working with a unit that would be about 100 megawatts, which today can be more of the typical add-ons you, you're going to get. We're not going to be getting into the range of you know, uh, 800 to 1,000 megawatts, or if you think about the nuclear plants, you know, three to 6,000 uh, megawatts. That's not going to happen anymore. One of the reasons is you don't need all that capacity right away. You need some of it, but you don't need all of it. So why not just build it incrementally? So when we were doing the analysis, it was, was always based on looking at a smaller but reasonably typical size that you would be uh, requesting. Now, when we did that, we also had to look at where we're going in terms of price. So our levelized cost for electricity is actually going down over time. This is the electricity generation part. Now, we're seeing that because of two principal reasons. One is the price of natural gas has gone down and is likely to stay down for an extended period of time. Who knew we were going to be uh, floating around with uh, $2 per MMBTU uh, natural gas? Uh, when a few years back we were at the $14 range for a period of time. So when we looked at the attributes related to the storage, we wanted to make sure that we were fitting with the requirements of the uh, service. So solar, you're looking at shifting from daylight to other hours, and we found that lithium and flow batteries were more economical to provide this service. So we're not talking about a long period of time, it's just a number of hours. Uh, in terms of interday and interweek, which is something that you would need for wind, uh, hydrogen fuel cells became economical over time. Compressed air uh, can provide long-term storage, but they're very site-specific. What we found was if you didn't have some exact uh, characteristics for your compressed air, it was going to be uneconomic. So as part of this, we, we noticed that um, at this point in time, there's probably a better opportunity to move forward with compressed, uh, uh, compressed air systems than you would see in like five or, or 10 years. There's more competition coming along the way. If you don't get the projects in place now, you're not likely to get them in place in the future. So I've just been told I'm out of time. I'm just going to scoot through. There's opportunities to reduce capital costs or not uh, very many. Uh, again, reducing capital costs, not a lot of opportunities unless you've got an existing field. Just talking about existing caverns and being one of those opportunities to reduce those costs. And then in terms of concluding remarks, pumped hydro and compressed air may be cost effective in specific locations. However, for the majority of the case three type projects, you're looking at uh, flow batteries and hydrogen fuel cells that are gonna to start to be, uh, dominate the market. Thank you very much.